this is a really cool video that I actually, I think I sent this to Carlos and Noah probably. Um, Christian Parenti video uh, where he's talking to Katie Halper, who's a real um, cool journalist or sort of news figure. Um, I think she's sort of like a liberal. Um, I'm not positive, but any, either way, she's pretty smart and pretty good at what she does. Um, and Parenti here is going to talk about diversity and say that diversity is a ruling class ideology, which is something that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers in academia. Um, something that's going to, you know, upset a lot of people and shock a lot of people, honestly. But as we were showing in the last video, which was a really good video for Carlos to pick before we watch this one, um, you know, the sort of woke capitalism is the antithesis of class struggle. Um, so the the way that the bourgeoisie uses diversity, um, diversity rhetoric and diversity ideology to break up class struggle is, you know, imperative to understand in the modern day if we're going to put any kind of real materialist <coughs> working class struggle together. Um, so, yeah, you got anything to say about this video before we play it, Carlos? Um, no, thank you for sending it. There's a really good comment that just came in about Maurer. I don't know if we should leave it because uh, we're starting the other segment. But um, yeah, it's I can, I can see the video being somewhat uh, controversial. But I think that if we fail to criticize the developments in the liberal wing of capital, our um, critiques of the ruling class hegemony is going to be at best one sided. And we want to avoid that. So keep your minds open and if there's any parts that uh that uh, go beyond where you feel comfortable you know um you can uh, critique that i guess or something but um always keep your mind open to, to criticizing the liberal wing of capital as well you know it's a very often it's just the the right but the left is also fundamental uh the left wing of, of imperialism and, and of neoliberalism is always fundamental uh for for the project as a whole So what made you write this piece in the first place? Well, one is just the, the you know, the prevalence of uh, diversity as ideology, diversity ideology, uh, you know, Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo, this, this sort of stuff, it's everywhere and it's it's in every workplace. So there's that element of it, but it's also uh, rereading Federalist 10, really reading it. I'd read it in college or something, but in writing the Hamilton book, I read it. And it's an amazing document because it's the ruling class saying the quiet part out loud. And it was written by James Madison. And Madison was one of the, like probably the most important driving force behind designing the constitution. And the Constitution had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. And that ratification was actually not guaranteed. There was a lot of opposition to the Constitution because it created a, a very centralized and powerful state. And a lot of Americans felt, wait a minute, we, you know, we just threw all, we fought a war to get rid of such a state. And now they, you know, a, a couple years after the fighting, there's this period of like interregnum where there's a different document serving as, a, as the Constitution. It's called the Articles of Convention, um, uh, the Articles of Convention, I'm spacing out, it's early here in the morning, Confederate, Articles of Confederation. And, um, you know, that left most power to the states, basically. And that leads to a crisis in the 1780s. And it's out of that crisis culminating in Shays' Rebellion, which is a class war by indebted farmers against the creditors who are bleeding them dry. And in response to that, they hold the Constitutional Convention and they create the Constitution, which creates a, a very centralized and powerful state. And a lot of people did not like that. And so ratification of the Constitution, which required a majority vote uh, in nine, you know, nine states had to pass, the agreed to ratify the Constitution. And then all 13, all 13 states agreed that if nine of us ratify this, then we'll all go along with it. But it was not at all clear that nine states would ratify it. And so Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay got together and they wrote a series of essays, 85 essays in all, that are later known as the Federalist Papers. And each of these essays took on an argument against the Constitution, against ratification, and countered it and said, look, look don't be concerned about that, blah, 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 blah. And so Madison in Federalist 10 addresses elites and he says, many fear that if we have political democracy, this will lead directly to economic democracy that political democracy will lead to class leveling. And the ruling class, the property classes in those days had no compunction whatsoever of being open saying, we don't want that. Why would we do that? You, wait, 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 you, you, this is dangerous. You give like common laborers uh, uh, the right to speak, the right to assemble, uh, you know, vote even, um, run for office. No, this is crazy. It's going to lead to economic democracy. They're going to come for our wealth and try and redistribute it. And so Madison said, don't worry about that. That is not, that's not that big a risk. He says, the only, political democracy only threatens economic democracy if the majority of people who are effectively propertyless get together and oppose those who own most of the property. And he says it in those terms. 
very, very explicitly. It says, look, society is, has forever been riven by faction and faction has myriad sources. It can be, you know, religious belief, uh, adherence to some political leader, geography, right? There's all sorts of sources of faction, as he calls it. And faction would be translated into our modern language as like interests, interest group, right? And there's, there's infinite ways to sort of divide and define people's interests, right? And he said, the risk of faction is only if that majority faction gets together. If the majority of people who are poor or propertyless get together and oppose the minority who own everything. And he says, so the solution to preventing that is to lean into the problem of faction, to encourage faction, to encourage division among people, and to encourage a hypervarigation of interests. And I mean, that is essentially what modern diversity ideology does, is don't think of yourself as a worker. Don't think of yourself as an employee. Think of yourself as a subset of that. You are a trans worker. You are a, a, a worker who's a woman. You are a person of color. And, and, and you should think in these subcategories and not in the more universal category of being a worker, being someone who does not have property, et cetera, right? So it's like, so yeah, a lot there. Um, pretty interesting. Uh, you want to go first, Carlos? Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, throw me the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just something real quick. Uh, I don't know if the folks know, but um, the first uh, case of red baiting in the U.S. goes back to Madison uh, red baiting Thomas Jefferson and 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 Payne and some of the more progressive factions of the uh, re revolutionaries which supported the French Revolution and were called atheists and, and anarchists and uh, foreign agents by, by Madison. Uh, but it's interesting here to see in, 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 in Federalist 10, uh, you know, the quiet part, as he says, said out loud, which is that divide and conquer, you know, keep people whose interests are fundamentally the, uh, the same or quite similar, keep them divided, uh, uh, proliferate and and pick on divisions which are organically there so that those get more and more pronounced and keep them fighting with each other and you know the history of cointel pro shows that that's one of the the central things that the state department has done to the left um and you know it's it'd be pretty foolish to think that cointel pro is 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 gone you know this is something that uh is, is prevalent in, in social media and definitely embedded in this diversity culture, which um, it does something very strange. You know, anti-racism anti uh, in the communist movement took the form of a determinate form of class struggle. So like in Du Bois, you have something very interesting going on in like Black Reconstruction. The first chapter is dedicated to the Black worker. And that's not done in this like, um, in this way that he's describing as diversity uh, politics that's just, you know, trying to divide and create a bunch of subcategories. It, it's done for the sake of unity. You know, the, the working class movement at the time didn't consider uh, the black slave and the slave worker, they didn't consider them part uh, as a worker. And because they didn't consider them as a worker, they couldn't envision the idea of the working class movement in the North. And there, there wasn't really a working class movement in the South, but the working class movement in the North linking up with the abolitionist movement, with the movement of slaves. So by bringing forth the category of the black worker, it's not just an act of you know anti-racism, which is of course fundamental and, and itself a form of class struggle, but it creates the conditions for a more unified form of class struggle. Now you can fight as a working class because you're recognizing the black worker as a worker, not just as this other you know uh, slave uh, being that has nothing to do with my struggle. You're linking up struggles so that they can wage the struggles together and become, as Du Bois says, an irresistible force. It's the complete opposite nowadays with diversity ideology. Instead of linking the struggles against individual forms of super exploitation or oppression that are faced by specific groups of the working class, instead of linking those as a class struggle to the general struggle of labor against capital, those are intensified and driven to extremes where what matters is not the class element in it, but the representational element. And they get uh, embedded into this PMC and, and petty bourgeois form of, of politics that's really embedded in the iron triangle of the academia, the media, and the NGOs. And that's the sort of activism that comes out of that and that predominates today in the left. Absolutely. And I also find it interesting how the only time 
the ruling class or the the advocates of this um, woke capitalism or diversity ideology, postmodernist ideology, whatever you want to call it. The only time they call for class unity is when it's like an act of imperialism, when they're talking about bringing women's rights to Afghanistan or, you know, supporting the feminist cause in Iran, which is actually just a U.S. regime change effort. Then they call for unity, right? They say, why don't you stand behind this, you know, movement for women's rights, which is actually, you know, uh, an imperialist movement that's been disguised or a regime change effort disguised as a movement for women's rights. But then they say, um, you know, be an ally, be an ally to this movement, um, you cishet white males or whatever. Um, that's the only time they call for unity and unity behind, you know, um, uh, a woke movement, which is actually, like I said, a, a regime change project being being disguised or being made up. Um, <clears throat> other than that, yeah, it's just a way to cause division. Um, yeah, I guess we can keep watching the video unless you have more, Carlos. I think a good example is police violence. Um, you have a case where black people are disproportionately killed by police. That is absolutely true, and racism is a fundamental component uh, in these killings and in and in the you know, murderous and brutal and carnal activities of, of the police departments. But it's also the case that the vast majority of people that have been killed in the U.S. by police have been white. That's a fact, you know, but that's a fact that we don't talk about. Why don't we talk about that fact? Because then we will realize, as you know, scholars like Adolf Reed Jr. have done, um, that the main component uh, behind this uh, murderous activity on the part of the state's armed bodies of men is class. They attack poor people, uh, but disproportionately. That's the most disproportionate group being attacked. Poor people, poor people being killed. But if you present that narrative in that way, then you create the grounds for multiracial working class solidarity. Then white people can identify their struggle against uh, capital and the state with the struggle of black people who are disproportionately killed, with the struggle of brown people. And everyone can connect their struggles and realize that there's a common basis for their exploitation and oppression, and that the only way to throw off the yoke of their exploitation and oppression is by coming together and fighting collectively for that. So they can't do that. So they emphasize, you know, one part of the killings, which is, you know, you have to emphasize there are races and that it's a disproportionate amount. But I've never seen in the news mention about the other statistic and those are all human bodies also being murdered by armed by the armed bodies of men of the state, and that has, in my in my view, in the last you know six seven years of activism that I've been doing, I've never seen that mentioned anywhere, and that's a fundamental fact that would create cross racial class solidarity in fighting against uh, police abuses, in fighting against the state, and fighting against capital. I mean, I would encourage people to actually read. Adolf Reed's um, text on this or his essays on this because they're pretty short but concise. Um, and like Carlos was saying, he's never seen or he hasn't seen that many people make this point before, but he makes it so concisely and just lays out the statistics. Like here is the percentage that police are killing black people. You know, it's much higher than white people. Um, so clearly there's a racial element here. But here's the percentage that police are killing poor people versus rich people. And it's freaking astronomical. It's like almost all poor people and they never shoot rich people um, regardless of what color they are. Um, it's like rich black people are slightly more likely to be shot than rich white people. But a poor white person is still more likely to be shot than either of them. Um, <clears throat> and he just lays it out simply, tells it how it is. And at the time, you know, it created a internet meltdown or created a meltdown amongst leftists, you know, who tried to cancel a, a black professor for um, giving his opinion or giving his analysis about police violence, um, which shows the absurdity. Um, like like the, the diversity advocates and the advocates of identity politics oftentimes end up canceling like a, a great black professor like Adolf Reed. They don't even end up, you know, uh, they don't even follow through on their own um, principles, supposed principles of um, treating uh, people with a certain skin color um, differently or with privilege or whatever. Um, so. Think about other aspects of your interest, of your self-interest, other than the economic aspect. So that's what that, that's what Federalist 10 argues. Is that's what we have to do is we have to proliferate faction. And if you do that, then you will make it impossible for the majority of 
the population to unite and wage, he doesn't say a class struggle, but that's what he's describing, to, to wage a struggle about who owns what, who gets what. Did they just like political democracy, but not like economic democracy? Like they were committed to political democracy or was it just strategic? Well, um, it was a bit of both. I mean, there were, there were elites who, American elites who wanted enough democracy to push back against the control of the British crown, right? So that's why there's a revolution. I mean, there's a revolution because there are enough different factions with enough different reasons that all make them want political democracy and freedom that they can get together on the basic question of like, let's get the Brits out of here and make our own laws. But then once that done, once that was done, then all the internal divisions come out and, and most prominent among them is the class division. Um, and there's also the division around slavery. So there was, you know, different groups had different interests in democracy, right? And so the slaveocracy in the South, they're like, democracy for us means we locally here in South Carolina, we decide what we're going to do. Not everybody, property owners here in South Carolina decide what they're going to do. And that means that you abolitionists up North have no say. That's undemocratic. We, we control our business here. But then there was, you know, this rhetoric of freedom was very open and vague and all sorts of people grabbed onto it and filled it with their own meaning. So there was a, a very considerable working class, you know, popular class drive to the American Revolution. Workers heard freedom and like they interpreted it in their own ways. So everyone who fought, you know, on the American side, and not all Americans did, there were plenty of loyalists who, who thought, this is crazy. We, you want to leave the largest empire in the world? Like what? No. Um, so, but all the patriots and you know, all the revolutionaries had various readings and very, brought various meanings to what democracy would be. And this played out concretely around questions like the property qualifications to vote. And some states had property qualifications, some didn't. The U.S. Constitution, to its credit, does not include property qualifications. There's no racial uh, restrictions on voting or on office holding. There are no gender restrictions on voting. Um, so you said a lot of interesting things there, um, which now I'm kind of spacing on, um, unfortunately. Um, what the heck was I going to say? Save me, Carlos. Add some analysis while I recall what I was going to say. Um, well, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was kind of spacing too, but uh, it's late in the night. But one of the, <laughs> one of the things that I, I think it's important to um, – it, it's just so refreshing the fact that he's referring to it as – a revolution that's so rare to see on the left that it has, uh, you know, dogmatically accepted this this counter-revolution thesis, which um, is not just, a, in my view at least, historically wrong, but um, uh, necessarily leads one. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. The yeah, forms of national, Horn. yeah, yeah, the forms of national nihilism, which I think are so prevalent uh, today. But um, yeah, it's it's. I haven't read Federalist 10, but it's I, I'm I am going to read it because it is saying uh, things that are you know just so fundamental for the ruling class divide and conquer like the the idea of race itself the modern idea of race was completely fabricated it was a fabrication of you know of early stage capitalism uh, used for the sake of dividing working class people and you know uh, one of the things that a you know run of the mill leftist might uh, respond is that, you know, by doing this, we are class reductionists or whatever. And the response to that would be that it's completely uh, wrong. Um, we do hold as Marxists that class struggle is the engine of movement of history, that if you take away class struggle from Marxism, you don't have Marxism anymore. But it's important to remember that that phrase uh, is the history of all hit earth or existing societies is the history of class struggles. And it's plural because class struggles, again, as a universal, in order for them to exist, need to take uh, shape in the particular. They need to concretize itself in the particular. And as Dominico sort of argues, there's no such thing as a pure class struggle. There's always different forms of class struggle. There's the, you know, the more traditional one between directly between capital and labor at the factories, at, at the place of production. But there's also national struggles for liberation, which are a form of class struggles. There's a struggle against racism as a form of class struggle. There's a struggle against patriarchy, which Engel says, you know, the first form of class struggles uh, is, is, is the struggle uh, against uh, the patriarchy. Um, you know, it's one of the statements that he makes in the origins of the family, private property and the state. And so the issue of like, you know, prioritizing class struggle, it isn't ignoring these other things, but uh, seeing those types of struggles through the lens of class struggle. And for instance, 
you couldn't develop a collective class struggle in the US if one part of the working class, specifically in the South, it's so racist that it's literally fucking lynching another part of the working class. You know, are you supposed to come together and fight if you have two groups that are so hostile to one another that one is literally lynching the other one? And it's not just an event that, you know, the bad guys are just the lynchers. It's literally basically treated as a fucking picnic where people are coming. They're placing bets in order to take home body parts. They're taking their children. They're eating, you know, hot dogs and, and burgers. And, you know, it's, it's a fucking obscene, disgusting spectacle. And to think that you can wage a collective class struggle without tackling the question of racism and obliterating racism from the consciousness of the white working class in that context is just impossible. So the, the struggle against racism in that context is the form of class struggle. The form class struggle takes uh, as a determinate form of struggle. So, you know, without dialectics, these people can see that when you talk about emphasizing class struggle, it doesn't mean you're ignoring these other things but that you're looking at them from the angle of class struggle so that those struggles against racism and against sexism or you know whatever the case may be don't be don't get reduced to what they are reduced now which is that freedom for these groups is representing them in 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 movies and in politics and you know having diverse faces in high places and you know the places that continue to perpetuate an order which continues to exploit and oppress all sorts of different people around the world yeah, and Christian Parenti's got a skill similar to his dad um, of applying dialectics to history without even really saying what he's doing explicitly. But um, I remembered what I wanted to say earlier, other than pointing out the um, false theory of counter-revolution um, that uh, Gerald Horn puts out that um, Parenti here debunks and has been debunked by others like Anthony Montiero and uh, Marius Trotter. Um, but also that he's talking about how this idea of freedom which often you know in in the u.s lore is used in the abstract or by the ruling class is used in the abstract we have the most freedom you know but of course freedom can't be universalized um what does freedom mean so he says that freedom starts to be particularized in all these different groups start latching on to the idea of freedom and saying you know what is our idea or what is our idea of freedom and that usually tends to be based on their economic class. So you have the enslavers in the South saying freedom for us is we get to decide how to run our government. You have to leave us alone, right? We have our own state. We have our state's rights. We think that the slave owner should be able to decide what to do. And that's freedom. And you have the patriots, you know, who say freedom is throwing off the, the British, um, the British empire and starting our own country. And um, all these different groups start to particularize um, and concretize for themselves what the idea of freedom is, um, which, yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no freedom, universal freedom in the abstract. Uh oh, we might've lost Carlos. I think Carlos has passed. Oh, he said he has to go pee. Okay. We'll play a little bit more in the video. I'm about ready to fall asleep to be honest, but. We'll see how much longer Carlos wants to go when he gets back. Or an office holding, but a lot of powers were left to the states and many states had property qualifications and then also uh, excluded women and excluded people of color from voting. Interestingly, not all of them did that. That the whole, it's not like everything was oppressive and then it all slowly got better and better. There were actually states that, I mean, things were quite oppressive and you know, racist and sexist, but, but, but there were some surprises. Like in New Jersey, women had the right to vote if they, had prop if they met the property qualifications. Um, and believe it or not, in South Carolina, African Americans who met the property qualifications could vote. But that's then quickly, like after the revolution, that's quickly undone. And most states, not all have property qualifications. Now, not all those property qualifications were particularly onerous. Some property qualifications were, you know, it basically meant that, um, you know, if you were, if you had, you know, if you owned a house or you had a wagon and you're self-employed, you could vote. It just meant that the, the true proletariat, the people who, you know, rented and had no tools, no business, they just sold their labor. They were the ones who were excluded from, from voting. But those were state laws. But anyway. I digress. But the point is why, you know, political democracy was an open, contested field. And so, like, part of what Federalist. And this is interesting here because it's kind of relevant. Um, yes, example, the upcoming Rage Against the War Machine protest in D.C. Um, on February 19th. Jimmy Dore is going, but some factions, Code Pink, Veterans Against War, threatened to not join. 
because they claim some speakers aren't sufficiently pro LGBTQ, et cetera, class divides and rule. Those factions should prioritize class over identity politics. Yeah, there's a really good concrete example, you know, in this war, uh, anti war rally. And we tweeted about this, you know, and saying, like, if you have people who you disagree with on other issues, but they are willing to agree with, you know, uh, to work with you in the anti imperialist struggle. You got to come together for what's best. You got to put the class struggle first, the anti-imperialist struggle first, the struggle against capitalism first. Um, like, by example, the Libertarian Party, who even has, you know, a totally def different economic ideology as us, they're willing to collaborate in certain ways to fight against the new Cold War and the NATO proxy war in Ukraine. So, you know, we need to make those inroads when it's possible. Um, and... The main thing is uniting people over class, you know, and, and like like Carlos was saying earlier, if there's bigotry, right, if there's actual bigotry and hatred for, you know, between different factions of the working class, um, that needs to be addressed. And, and fighting that battle, fighting against that is part of the class struggle. That's part of unifying the working class. Um, but in a situation like this, in a concrete situation like this, um, yeah, you got to unify um, with those speakers to put on a really good and a really big event that gets the um, gets the attention of the ruling class. Um, and, you know, for, for the time being, put your disagreements and, and differences aside a little bit. I think. I don't know if you have anything yeah. to say about that. I, I was sad that other uh, progressive forces didn't get uh, behind that. Um it, what's interesting is that uh, some of those forces that failed to endorse that or that pulled back, they're perfectly fine with like real politic within the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, part of that real politic has been that even the, the most quote unquote progressive elements of the Democratic Party, people like Bernie Sanders, has recognized that in order in order to get certain um certain uh positive things pass he's had to work with with people he heavily disagrees on you know ideologically uh, on 99 percent of things but he's been able to realize that if i want to focus on passing this one sort of thing i got to work with whoever agrees on that one thing um and he's just i believe worked with uh ron paul in the past and um on anti-war issues but uh you know one of the one of the trends that ends up developing, I think, with this diversity ideology, as Christian Parenti calls it, is the inability to even think in terms of uh, principle and non-principle contradiction. Everything is treated as a principle contradiction. Everything. Even stuff that affects, you know, just 1% of the population, which, you know, it's not to, to call it unimportant, but everything is treated as a principle contradiction. And so if, if you have a group of people who disagree with one issue, which if you look at things objectively, it's not the principal contradiction because you have a framework that everything is equally as important. You're not going to work with that group of people. And I think the, the, the main thing that we have to focus on today is we have a criminal ruling class that's edging us closer and closer to nuclear Armageddon. And if I have people, regardless of, of how kooky they are, that want to build and bring their mass base into an anti-war uh, movement, that creates not only one, the opportunity to take their working people who are anti-war into a correct anti-imperialist position, which is often, you know, forgotten that, you know, you bring people to socialism by convincing them away from the wrong ideologies that they're in and towards the, the right positions. Not only is that the case, but you're able to, to, to focus on one issue and bring a mass base of people into that one issue. And, the paradox is that this is the, the people that rejected that sort of event are the ones that are perfectly fine with talking about building a mass uh, popular uh, front against war or something or a mass peace movement. But it seems to be that the only parts of the mass that they want to accept are the liberal ones. <laughs> so there's already some qualifications before who can be part of the anti-war movement. Yes, 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 everyone anti-war, but you have to be with us on these, you know, identity issues. And it's not that those issues aren't important. It's that, you know, the issue of 
escalating warfare into a nuclear Armageddon, I'm sorry, is a little bit more important. And that's the one that has to be emphasized.